me, I, I already started to this slide. Okay. For you, you don't have to share the link. Are there anybody? Or I don't know. What? Oh no. Um, do you have a microphone, or do we need you? Okay, we've got one. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah. So it's fine. Okay. Yeah. People have the link already. People, yes. People do have the link for that. So. Okay. But do I need to like release the events? Because right now the events are all private. Yeah. No, no, you can, you can, that's it. Okay. Um, but only for the screen, okay? That's okay. And then, uh, yeah, okay. Actually, what I'm going to do, because people might be tuning in while we're in the that's good. I'm going to keep it. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's good. I should do it. It's okay. It starts at 10. Ah, okay. But yeah. You don't want them to see anything? I mean, yeah, it's better. Because I right. was on. Is it working? It's working, but the, the colors. I, I added a box, mm -hmm. a small splitter. Okay. And the splitter make the this recognize the signal from the mic, but the colors are wrong. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna try to find another solution for this afternoon. But for this morning, we do that. If they don't like it online, you just pan. Okay. With the camera. Um, but for the most part, am I just staying like within the same framing? Because I watched the video and they just had one framing. Yeah, yeah. most of it from one framing, but make, make it a, a bit uh, interesting. Sometimes you zoom in, sometimes you zoom out. And, uh, okay? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> if you know, you stay on the speaker. If you move, you follow her. If you know, you stay on the speaker. Okay, but uh, like that. But if the thing doesn't work, maybe we'll time between the speaker and the screen. But I, I prefer to keep it like that. Just the colors are wrong, and I don't know what to do. At least I was able to get the signal. I'll try to find another solution for the question. Okay. Okay. Um, so for the most part, you want me on the medium, because on the video they were they, they were just like on the light the whole time with the um, projector in the background. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah. Most of the thing medium, yeah. Except if they move, yeah. except if they interact with the screen. So you just, the screen yeah. Then just that's why you're live. They show you're and they show yeah. Okay. Yeah. You should prepare um, a mic for them, you should mic her already. Do you know the software country? And give that no, to I Alex. I've heard of it, but I'm not familiar. So if you want to do a quick introduction. Oh, yes. Before, um, uh, before oh, I sorry. go, just to explain <laughs> to you, okay? Uh, Camera. Um, are they What's arriving that? after 10? No, they should, they, oh, I told them 9.30. Uh -huh. Yeah, so... Uh, I feel personally I'm just like all over the No, I appreciate it. Okay. So let me go check and see how many actually I'll ask for well we can start passing them out now. So you check how many people have come in have not come in Thank you so much. Okay. 
Okay, so just, it doesn't really work when you take the side. Okay, if you want to, um, you see the sprinter. Yeah, okay, the camera, the cameras go in here on channel one. On channel one, and it goes out. On, and I'm just, just put one on every seat, even if there's not someone there, and that way it's going to show up late. Okay, that's fine. Okay. And the out way that works is. Uh, just one red, one blue. Oh, no, 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 but are you going to explain? Oh, oh, no. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. We've got about nine people who haven't shown okay, up yet. I have two sources. Yes. Okay, we're just going to put them on every seat. Sounds mm -hmm. good. Thank okay. you. It goes to the splitter sure. first. Yeah. And from the splitter, it goes... Why did I do that? Oh no, I'm sorry. Two sources. Camera and laptop. Mm -hmm. The camera goes directly to channel one here. Okay. okay. And, the, and the laptop goes to the splitter, mm -hmm. input three, and goes out three and four. Okay. One will go to here and one goes back to there. I was supposed to send back the but I don't need that because I have two outputs on the map. Okay. So sourcing one, two. Camera and laptop. Mm -hmm. Okay. The output it goes to the splitter, to split signal one to the screen and one to the tube. Okay. okay? Because I have only one output yeah. out of this. So this to the speaker and one here and one here. Okay. Okay? Good? Yeah. Just uh, at least you, <laughs> you get it. This output. Yeah, this one, which one is this one connected to? Yeah, it goes to uh, it's one. One. Yeah. And then it goes to output one and two. But these are the ones that are going out. One to the other. One to the other. Okay. And this one, forget about the second one. Because I, I don't use it now. Okay. So one, it goes here and here. Okay. 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 If no, you, you follow input output. Where did you put the computer source? The computer here. In here. Yeah. So both the camera and the computer are in here. Yeah. One okay. One. Yeah. Because yeah, this is outputting the signal from those yeah. two. Okay. Cool. cool. One and two. Okay. So now it's live. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We leave this. Maybe I wish we switch to the screen. Okay. Hello, how are you? Except that the follow are wrong on this screen. I'm sorry, I don't know why. Uh, yeah. At least it's better than the other one because uh, we had no signal. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> hey, okay. So, this is what Mike is going to do my questions or anything. And then who is the speaker? Jess. Jess. Okay. Hi, Jess. Can you get a moment? Okay. Give me just one second. Yeah. And then I have a monitor from the streaming. Okay. What Wi-Fi? The camera. Oh, yes. So I want this, but that's the email. Yeah, she's the best too. Okay. I have to go. All right. I'll see you later. So you're not going to wear your jacket? No. Alright, so this this one can go in a pocket, you can clip it, or you can just put it in the pocket? Yeah, pocket. Um, or oh, clip, clipping it outside the pocket, yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Right. And this one, just put right here on your lapel. Yep. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. You can just do me a favor, just give me a test real quick. Test one, two, three. Test one, two, three. Oh, sorry, give me a second. <laughs> Test one, two, three. Test, 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 test. One, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Oh, good. Testing, one, two, three. Cool. Is working? Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, I didn't hear it. Hey, Tom. Hey, it's great. Good, how are you? Okay. Okay, so, Jess. Yes. Tom, in two minutes. So I can see some procedural stuff and then Tom can do some inspiring work. And then at 9.45, I can do the If we adjust the volume here, you will need to adjust it on the camera. Uh, so yes. Um, what exactly do I need to cover? Um, we have it or we don't have it? Just, 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 just
Just get them to clone it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now I'm on mic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell that. <laughs> All right. Cool. Okay. All right. Yeah, I can do that. Um, Am I recording this? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I, 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 I will change the quality okay. now you said that. Because you have two cards, I want you to record the full level. Right. Each hour for the uh, yeah, I will reduce it a little bit. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Till 17, so that you have 16 hours on each card. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then we'll talk about uh, <laughs> oh, no, it. Exactly it should be enough for the 40s, but we we can go back up every day. That's great. Yeah. You can have a little more second card. Okay. Okay. Are there people like that? If something happens, don't do that. Uh, yes, Priority, you record and you plan. Okay. If there's nothing working, you record the plan, so at least we have that. Yeah. Uh, okay. After that, after that, uh, you can take care of this problem. Okay. 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 Sounds good. And okay. I'm not far, I can have it. Except, except Thursday. So there won't be here. Okay. Oh, we're going. More work up. Oh. Uh, are you going camping again or no? No. Nice no. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. But at least we have Wonderful. Yeah. Yep. So and then, what, because we're going to. So, what's that going to look like at the end? Is there any way? Is it going to be recording a pure stream from that so that, it won't, that discoloration won't matter when the final one is edited? So, or. And it's also on the Berkeley Institute data science channel. Well. Ah, so if you just search YouTube for the Berkeley Institute data science, go through their channel and you'll be able to see it. Okay. Yeah, no, I love them. Yeah. I mean, that's the only way I can get motivated. Awesome. Thank you. Right now is that we need to bring something to the reporter, maybe I think a reporter and then a um, shop in my and just a little bit. Yeah. 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 Yes, is it live? Uh, yes, it's live. Hold on. Try it. Test. Again? Ah, yeah? Yeah. Ah, okay, good. So remember, each, each time you adjust. Okay, hi, everybody. Uh, I hope yeah. you enjoyed your breakfast. Welcome to the Day of Underground workshop. So we're going to be talking about the Day of how some of the tools of data science can be applied in the context of psychology. So uh, I think as psychologists, we're used to answering questions about the mind using a pretty standard set of methods when you come into the lab or you go online and run an experiment. But as psychology has kind of stayed with those methods, the rest of the world has moved on, and now there are many other ways that we can think about getting different kinds of data to give us information about the kinds of questions that psychologists are interested in, questions about how human minds work. So, our goal in putting this together was really to have the chance to introduce an audience of you know, graduate students and young researchers who are really interested in using these sorts of methods to answer their own questions to some of the tools that are out there, and also to create uh, some 
videos, so we're going to be recording all of the tutorials that you see that can be used by people who aren't able to be here today. Uh, so this, uh, the, the Center for Data on the Mind, which is the, the sort of be the, 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 the basis for this workshop series, is something that's been supported by the National Science Foundation, and then this particular event was supported by the, uh, the William K. Estes Fund. So uh, everything that happens for the next few days would not have been possible at all without Alex Paxton, who has been, and, and as you have experienced, getting a lot of emails and so on, the force behind making these things happen. Uh, and uh, Todd Gerkes and Mike Frank have uh, helped um, me on the, the sort of advisory side, but, but really this is you know, Alex's baby, and I think she's put together a really exciting program. So Alex, do you want to come up and tell people a little more about what's going to be happening? Yeah, of course, of course. thrilled to have y'all here. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your summer to come and engage with what I think is an incredibly exciting lineup over the next four days. So um, a few housekeeping notes. So what we're going to be doing is having breakfast here from 9 to 9.30 every day. But if you can make sure that you're here ready to go at 9.30 because we will be starting promptly every day at 9.30. Um, lunch will be a half an hour break from 12.30 to 1. That'll be here in the same area where the food was there. Uh, if you need to use the restroom at any time, um, you can go uh, take a take a right out of these back doors, take a, sorry, take a left out of these doors, take another left, and then you're gonna go down the very long hallway to your right. Um, if you have questions about um, anything, we do have some wonderful teaching assistants and um, instructors here. If you are an instructor, if you're an instructor or a teaching assistant, if you could stand up and just wave real quick. Um, these are the faces of the wonderful people who've taken time to be here and share their knowledge with you. So if you have questions, feel free to approach them. If you have any questions, also feel free to approach me at any time. Um, if you have not activated your Slack account invitation, um, please do that as soon as you can because we will be um, communicating a lot through Slack. Um, if you have problems with the internet or anything, which I hope you don't have, please Please raise your hand or send me a Slack channel uh, or Slack message the best or something. Uh, and we're trying to get together a um, social event tonight. Uh, we'll get more information for y'all soon. Um, an update on that will be coming on Slack. So again, um, those are some housekeeping details. So uh, Jess is going to just, uh, get you a little bit more up to date on this, but this should be your Wi-Fi, the Cal Visitor, unless you're in an edgy room institution when you can access that. Uh, and then just keep an eye out for um, these information. This is where you're going to be accessing the server environment, and this is going to be your password. Um, when that happens, you're going to be using the email address that you gave us when you signed, it, signed up for this event. Um, I think that's it for me. Um, thank you all again, and um, we'll hand this off to Jess. Thanks, Alex. All right, um, so just before we actually get into we have to do a few housekeeping things. So first thing is, you might be wondering what these sticky notes are. Uh, we pass these up. Um, this is a practice from uh, an organization called Software Carpentry, and uh, basically the idea is, as we're going through the tutorial, at least, well, I'm going to do this in my tutorial. Other instructors can decide whether they want to do it or not too. But if you are following along and everything's going great, and like you're, you know, finishing exercises and stuff, put a blue sticky note on the back of your computer like this. Um, and if you're confused and stuck and you don't know what's going on, then you can put a red sticky note on the back of your computer. Don't put both of them at the same time because then people won't know. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, um, sometimes I might ask you specifically to say, like, do this exercise, and when you're done, put up a blue sticky note. Um, but the teaching assistants um, will be able to help you out if you get stuck. And if I see a lot of red sticky notes, it will tell me that I need to slow down. So um, that sounds good to everyone? Okay. So then, um, to actually get started, what we're going to do is access the Jupyter Hub server and uh, call in the Git repository. So to access the Jupyter Hub server, like Alex said, uh, you need to go to this URL, um, bit.ly slash dotm-workshop, um, and then the password is dotm062017-sdsworkshop. Um, and when you uh, put in that URL, I think I'll, I'll just um, Type it in myself so yeah. I can't see the. Oh, okay. Um, just, if you want to, yeah, please. So bit.ly slash DOTM workshop. 
it'll ask you to log in, and then once you've logged in with the, again, the uh, uh, email that you use to sign up for the workshop, and then the password that's um, listed there, um, you'll see something that says start server, and you click that, and then it'll log out, and then, so. I just pushed the information also to the Slack channel. So you should see either something like this, or you'll see a screen that kind of looks like this, and then just click on my server. Okay. Um, then once you've done that, what you're going to do is go to new. And this, if you're familiar with the command line, this gives you a terminal in your browser um, that you can use to do whatever command line things you want um, with this JupyterHub server. Um, if you're not familiar with the command line, that's fine. Um, we're only going to run one command, which is uh, the command to get all the files um, uh, on this server so that you can actually access them. So what you're going to type is git clone, and then um, https clone slash slash www.github.com slash data on the mind slash 2017 summer workshop. And then press enter, and it should say cloning into 2017 summer workshop, and a bunch of stuff will print out, and then um, you'll have your files available. So can everyone put up a blue sticky note when you have gotten to this point? Birthday address. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> Okay, are people still working? Um, it looks like I mostly see blue sticky notes, but if 
anyone still trying to get this to work? Um, then we can, we have plenty of time, so I, I want to make sure we're just all on the same page before we start. Okay? All right. So after you ran this command, if you go back to um, this home tab, what you should see is now there's a directory here called 2017 Summer Workshop. Um, and if you click on that, you'll see all of the files from, these are all the different um, tutorials that you're going to go through over the next few days. Um, we're going to start with um, Hamrick Introduction to Jupiter, because that's me, just Hamrick. Um, so for the next few hours, uh, you're just going to stay in this directory. You don't need to worry about any of the other files. Um, and so the way that my tutorial is going to be structured is to go through um, uh, the basics of the Jupyter Notebook. And then um, depending on how much time we spend on that, we'll, we'll go through a few more advanced topics as well. Um, so can I just get a show of hands who has used the Jupyter Notebook before, or the iPython Notebook? OK, about half of people, I think. OK, good. So for those of you who have used it, the first few notebooks will be a little bit boring. Um, apologies in advance. Um, but maybe um, it would be helpful if you're sitting next to someone who hasn't used the notebook and if they um, have questions or are confused about anything, if you could um, you know, help them out with it, that would be great. Um, otherwise, um, we'll uh, I guess go ahead and get started. So um, oh, let me just, I'll give you a brief overview of what, what we're going to cover. So in the basics folder, um, you'll see a notebook for each part of the tutorial. So we're going to first just kind of go over what the Jupyter Notebook is. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Markdown. Um, and then we're going to switch to talking about how to actually um, you know, load in data into the notebook, uh, manipulate it, plot it, um, use Matplotlib, which is this plotting library, interactively, um, and then also do some analysis with pandas and SAS models. So um, this is kind of, it's a little, it's a sort of a blend between um, both doing data analysis with Python and specifically doing it in the Jupyter Notebook. Um, and then in the advanced section, um, we're going to get into some more uh, cool, fun things that you can do in the notebook. Um, so like how to create publication quality plots, um, how to uh, create animations in the notebook, um, and uh, how to do some more interactive data analysis using um, IPython widgets, um, how you can switch between Python and R in the notebook, um, and then also how you can take the notebook and um, export it to other formats, just for example, like to make blog posts and stuff like that. Um, OK, but we'll get to that later. So we'll start with basics. Um, so you can go ahead, go to the basics folder, and then just click on introduction to the Jupyter Notebook, and it should load in a new tab. Might take a few seconds. Okay. So um, the way that I write all of these notebooks is it's kind of their own standalone tutorial. So I'm not going to read through all of the stuff in there because that would be boring if I have me here. Um, but it's it's more there for um, these to be a resource for you if you get stuck um, at any point today or you just want to like dive into something more deeply. Um, you should be able to come back to these notebooks later after the workshop um, and, and sort of uh, get a lot of the same information. Um, so the Jupyter Notebook is a document format um, that's really useful for doing data analysis, but also um, like creating documents that have like code and text and images and math and basically anything that you might want in like a lab notebook, you can put it in the Jupyter Notebook. So it's sort of like this like interactive lab notebook. Um, so if you click around, you can click on these things. These are called cells. Um, and you can tell which one is selected by the blue bar and the gray outline. Um, and uh, so, for example, this, this cell here that I'm clicking on is a markdown cell. Markdown is a text markup language that basically renders um, text that you type, so it, it looks nice. So if I double click on this, um, it'll become unrendered, and you can see what the source of it is. So you can see here what it means for something to be um, rendered. So here we use this markdown syntax with the two asterisks around a word, and that makes that word italic. And so now if I want to render this again, I can click this play button here. And, and you see um, the, uh, that, um, that text, which we had marked as being italic, is in fact italic. So we'll get in more into like, how Markdown works in just a moment. But um, that's the basic idea, is that Markdown cells are ways for you to um, sort of you know, write out explanations and instructions and whatever you want. Um, and then the other type of cell is a code cell. Um, and that looks a little bit like an unrendered markdown cell, 
except you also see it has these like in, in brackets, colon, on the side. Um, that's one way you can tell it's a code cell. Another way is, you might have noticed this menu here, it says code. If I click back on the markdown cell, it switches to markdown, and you can switch the, the um, cell type just by changing that menu. Um, so now we have our markdown cell that's formatted like a code cell. We don't actually want that, so go back to markdown. Um, uh, but code cell means that you can actually run code in it. So um, if I said, you know, type print hello world, it'll actually print out beneath the cell um, hello world. And the way that I ran this cell um, is you can either, again, click this play button, or there's a lot of really useful shortcuts that you can use. So shift enter will run the cell. Um, and uh, you, or you can do also uh, control enter will also run the cell. Both of those are options. Um, okay. Uh, so there's sort of uh, two, um, there's two modes that you can be in, um, which we've seen a little bit now. Um, one is command mode and one is edit mode. Um, command mode is when you have this blue um, outline of your cell, and so that, when you're in this mode, that allows you to do things like move cells around, so I could like move this cell down or up, so change the, the order of the cells. Um, and then um, edit mode is actually editing the contents of the cells themselves. So notice when I click in this cell, the outline changes to green. Um, that, is, that lets you know that you're now in edit mode, and so anything that you type is going to actually change the contents of the cell rather than do something, you know, rather than like sort of, you know, doing things like changing the order of the cells themselves. Um, and this is uh, somewhat more of an important distinction when you get into um, like uh, keyboard shortcuts and stuff. Um, uh, so if you click on this keyboard here, oh no, sorry, that's the, uh, it's under help, keyboard shortcuts, um, you'll see it, they have a bunch of keyboard shortcuts listed both in, in command mode and in edit mode. Um, and so sometimes, some of these keyboard shortcuts you'll see, like Y, for example, um, to code here. If you try to type that in edit mode, it'll just type a Y. So you have to be in command mode for that keyboard shortcut to actually work. Um, so you can go through those keyboard shortcuts on your own just to discover what's there. I'm not going to go through them. Um, uh, but they are, it's definitely useful to learn the different keyboard shortcuts rather than do it, doing everything using this menu. Okay, so um, let's get now to um, back to sort of you know the fun things to do in the notebook, which is actually executing code. Uh, so I have some code here which just prints out numbers, the sum from one to ten. Um, so again, you can do shift enter or control enter. Um, and you notice that in this cell there's multiple print statements, and so similarly as we run the cell, multiple things get printed out beneath the cell um, in order as they're executed. Um, and uh, we can um, also only you know, just print something on the last line, that's fine too. There is something to be uh, aware of though, um, and this is both kind of, it, it can be a little bit confusing, but it's also really helpful in the notebook, is that you don't always have to use print statements. Um, you can just put a variable name on the very last line of the cell, um, and then when you run the cell, display the, the value of that variable. So you'll notice there's a, some differences between um, this cell and the one above it. This one says out 6, 55, whereas this one just has 55. So the out means that that's sort of like, that was the output of the cell that got ret returned at the end of the cell, whereas in this one it was printed, so there, it's not really an output of the cell exactly. Um, but it, it can be a little bit um, confusing, just so you're aware of that, um, that, that you can have those two different um, ways of sort of displaying outputs. Um, and in addition, this one only works at the end of the cell. So if you try to include something like total, but it's not at the end of the cell. So here's this is the same code, um, but now we have a print statement um, after we have total. If we do that, it doesn't display total because it's it's not, it's sort of, in order for it to mean returned, it has to be on the very last line of the cell. Um, okay. Um, so another, um, Thing about the notebook is that as you're running code, um, there's sort of there's something called a kernel that's running in the background um, that's keeping track of all of the code that you're running. So um, in this particular case, we're running the IPython kernel because it's Python. Um, but you, you can run lots of other types of kernels too. So there's an R kernel, um, there's a Julia kernel, there's a Bash kernel, 
Uh, there's JavaScript kernels, lots of different types of kernels. For now, we'll just uh, worry about the IPython kernel. Um, but one of the, the important things to take note is that this kernel is sort of has its own state. So as you're running and executing code, you're changing the state of the kernel. Um, and that means that the, the notebook itself is kind of just like a front end to view and execute code in the kernel, but the kernel itself is like sort of the important thing that's doing all the computation. Um, and so just like, you know, if you were in the uh, Python interpreter, um, you know, it, it's kind of, you can think of the kernel as kind of like a version of the, the Python interpreter. Um, you have to, you know, have declared all your variables before you actually use them. So if I try to run A, I get a name error because A is not defined. Um, but if I set A to a value, now I see I'm changing the same cell and I'm going to run the same cell. Now it works fine. Now if I changed it back to A and ran it again, now it works. And so even though, like, this is one of the confusing things about the notebook is that um, even though you can't see the code anymore that defined A, A is still defined in the kernel. So that's the, what I just did is actually not considered good practice. What's considered good practice is, would have been to say, okay, have that there and then you know, create a new cell and print it out or, or put it in the same cell so that you can always see all of the code that's, that's being executed. Um, and yeah, so now similarly this cell we can print out will, will work because um, A is not defined. Um, the one thing that can help you in keeping track of what are all the variables you can find and what their values are um, is this uh, special command. This is, so if you ever see something that starts with a percent sign, this is not a normal Python um, command, it's a Jupyter, or it's an IPython command rather, so it only works in the Jupyter notebook, um, or in the IPython terminal. Um, but if you do percent who's, and then you run that, it'll tell you what variables are defined, what their types are, and then um, what their values are. Uh, and that can be really helpful for if you say, don't remember if you have a variable defined, or you don't remember what, what value it is. You can either, if you remember the name of the variable and you just don't know what its value is, you can just, you know, create a new cell and and evaluate that cell to, to get the value of the variable, or you can use this who's command and that'll print out all of them. Um, I should mention, um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I mentioned it a little bit down um, earlier, later, I think, too, but I've been inserting and deleting a few cells. Um, the way that you do this is go to insert, and then you can either choose insert cell above or insert cell below. Um, and I've, I've been doing it with keyboard shortcuts, um, which are, if you're curious, A inserts above, B inserts below. Um, and again, you have to be in command mode to actually use those keyboard shortcuts. If you're in edit mode, it'll just type it into the cell. Um, and then to delete things, you can similarly go to um, edit, delete cells, um, or you can use the keyboard shortcut DD. You can just type D twice in succession. That'll delete the cell here. Okay. Um, so one additional thing now is after you've been working in the notebook for a while, you've de declared all these variables, and maybe like maybe you're trying to you know use best practices and make sure that you only sort of you know run the code that you you have like on in the notebook. But sometimes you want to you know edit. You write you write your code. You, you run it. It doesn't work, so you edit it and then you run it again. But maybe like the first time you ran the code, it did change some state, and so sometimes you just want to sort of start from a clean slate and and run all of the code in your notebook, um, not, not worrying about what's been run before. And to do that, you need to restart the kernel. Um, and the way you can do that is to click this restart button here, and that'll say, if you want to restart the kernel, all variables will be lost. Um, we can say yes, restart. And now, um, you know, if we went back up here and tried to um, you know, run our cell with A, we would find it doesn't work again, because now we've sort of cleared our entire state and started fresh. Um, and so that's a, you know, as I'm using the notebook, I will typically periodically come back and restart the kernel. Um, even if I, even if nothing's really wrong, I just tend to, to do it periodically, just kind of to, um, you know, uh, have peace of mind that everything is defined that is actually written in the notebook, um, that I, I didn't delete code that defines something, and now, you know, if I come back to this a month later, I won't know why my code doesn't work. Um, I just sort of periodically do that to kind of make sure everything is so um, just so you can get a little bit uh, comfortable working with the notebook, um, uh, we're just going to do a really quick exercise. Um, this, this should be a pretty simple Python code, just I want you to implement this function that um, you know, pr prints the um, prints hello, comma, name, or name is a variable that's passed in. Um, and to do this, you'll need to create a cell so you can actually test 
the function. Um, and uh, just you know, test that it works with, for example, hello data on the line. And then if you could take your blue stickies off now and put them back on when you're done. One more minute.
uh, it's really useful to uh, actually sort of document what you're doing and use this kind of rich text markup for that. Um, and so, uh, but it's, it's less important for the sort of the, the data analysis stuff that this workshop is about, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail, um, except just to kind of show um, you know, what are the, the various things you can do. And, and so these, um, these exercises are all um, optional. I'll give you a few minutes just to um, like scan through them and, and, and see what you can do. But um, what I've done here is I've, I've made an image of each of the things, and then the, the goal is to figure out how to um, achieve that same thing by using Markdown. So in case of italics, I showed you how to do that before. You do the asterisk and then surround the word with asterisks. And the syntax highlighting even gives you kind of a clue as to what it's going to look like when you render it. Um, it's italic here. Um, and then you render it, and it looks, looks like that. Similarly with orange um, is double asterisks. And you see it also gives you a hint here by making it bold. Um, and then you run it, and, and it's bold of orange. Um, so I, at the very top of this um, notebook, there is a, a website here that gives so basically, we'll tell you the answers to all of the questions in this in this thing, um, and so you can sort of fill this out at your leisure. I'll give you let's go to maybe um, ten fifteen now. You can just kind of like scroll through it and see what's available. Um, some of the coolest stuff that you can do are the the equations. So if you're doing anything that involves um, equations, it's useful to be able to write those. And the idea here is that you wrap them in dollar signs. So like y equals ax plus b in dollar signs will give you a nice and formatted equation. Um, so just take, yeah, four minutes now, um, look through what's possible, do fill out whatever you, you want to. It's not a big deal um, how far you get. Uh, we're just sort of to familiarize you with, with what, what the possibilities might be. And then remember, whenever if you ever see something that you are, are curious about how it, it's here, if you were curious how I made this um, look like uh, typewriter text, again, you can Double click on it and view the source and see, ah, there's back text there, and that's how they do that. Okay, we'll do just one more minute and then move on. Um, so if you have any questions, don't forget to put up a question or anything. Remember, you don't need to finish all of this.
Okay, um, so that's uh, just a very quick introduction to Markdown. Um, I will now move on to notebook number three, where we actually start to get into some of the fun stuff. Um, okay, uh, one thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to hide these um, these two uh, like toolbars just so that it's a little you have a, you can see a little bit more on the projector. Um, so just so you're not confused as to why yours looks different than mine. to how to actually like, get uh, data into the notebook. Um, so I, I know like uh, you were supposed to have done an introduction to Python, but how many of you are familiar with uh, like sort of the scientific computing libraries like Pandas or MATLAB? Okay. Again, about half of you. Okay, good. So, um, so there's, there's a few libraries that are kind of the staples of doing scientific computing in Python and in, in particular in the notebook. So you'll often see these like terms kind of used together with Jupyter, Matplotlib, Pandas, um, IPython, stats models, SciPy. Um, these are all kind of like uh, the core components of the Python ecosystem. Um, and so in, in this notebook, we're going to um, use two, well, three. We're going to use Pandas and Matplotlib and also a little bit of NumPy. Is kind of. NumPy is sort of the if you're used to using MATLAB or something like that, um, and you do all the matrix computation, that's like what NumPy does. But for a lot of the stuff we're going to do, it actually is, is doing it under the hood. Um, so we'll see a little bit of NumPy, but it's, it's mostly actually happening under the hood. Um, the two main ones that we'll focus on are Pandas and MatPolyp. So um, one uh, good practice, this is, this is good practice both for um, like when you're writing just regular Python scripts, but also if you um, are using the notebook, is to include all of your imports at the beginning of the notebook. Um, and that's so that you can um, sort of keep track of where all the functions are coming from that you've imported. Um, sometimes if you have imports scattered all throughout the notebook, it can be hard to keep track of what, what stuff came from where. So like, you know, if you have like this variable plt and you don't know where it came from, then it's, it's just easier if you kind of like scroll up to the top and look and see where everything came from there. So I always put all my imports at the top of the notebook and um, in, in this tutorial, with a few exceptions, that's what we're going to do too. So, um, so we're importing pandas and, and sort of a lot of these libraries have kind of standard um, abbreviations that you'll see. Um, so if you were to search for like help, you know, you, maybe you get an error and you Google for something you see on Stack Overflow, NP or PD. Um, PD almost always means pandas, NP always, always, almost always means numpy, PLT almost always means matplotlib.pyplot, um, uh, and, and there's a few other ones. Um, but just so you, that's sort of the, the incantation that we'll use um, because it's a little bit faster to type. And then there's another special thing here, which is this matplotlib inline. Um, so you, know, you saw like in a previous um, few notebooks, when we run code, it'll print out beneath the cell. Well, one cool thing about um, uh, the notebook is that you can also do the same thing with images. So you create a figure, and it'll display beneath the cell. But we have to tell it to do that, um, and so we use this, this line, that call of inline, to do that. And again, this is not a normal Python thing. This percent sign is, is only IPython, so it'll only work in the notebook. If you tried to do this in a regular Python script, um, it, it would give you an error. So, um, you know, just as a heads up about that. Um, okay, so we'll run this cell, get everything imported. This may take a few moments. Um, Matt Pollard, especially the first time that you import it, sometimes has to, um, like, create some, some caches for things, and so it may be a little bit slow, but um, just give it a few moments. Um, and then, once you have imported everything, um, we're going to read in our first data set. And so we're going to use pandas to do this. Again, that's pd. And pandas makes it super easy to read in CSV files, which are you know, one of the more common types of, of data files. Um, we can, we can, uh, one thing you can also do in the notebook is actually just to uh, um, look at, uh, you can run command line um, uh, functions using this exclamation point. So we do exclamation point, and then I can run something on the command line. So we can just do that to take a look at what is in this notebook, or uh, sorry, what is in 
uh, this uh, file. And, and so print out everything that's in this file, um, just you know, as a quick way to look at it. Another way that you could look at the file would actually be to come back over here to the um, notebook list to go into data, and then look at color similarities.csv. That's going to actually download the file for you, so then you have to open it locally, so it's a bit more involved um, to have to open the Excel. Um, uh, so let's actually not do that. We'll just look at it in the notebook like this. Um, and so uh, what, what is in here is basically this is uh, similarity ratings for different colors. Um, so these are the wavelength, the two wavelengths that are being compared, and then the rating um, the average rating is, is given in the third column. Um, so if I come down here now, if we do this pd.csv, what it's going to do is, is convert this CSV file into a nice data structure that we can access and manipulate from Python. Um, so I have assi assigned it to this colors variable. Um, I haven't printed anything out, so it kind of looks like nothing's happened, but if I do colors.head, it'll show us just the first few rows of that colors data frame. Um, that's, and that's the type of data structure this is called, is, is a data frame. Um, and it kind of displays it in this nice tabular format that's a lot easier to read than if you look at the CSV, like the raw CSV format. It's much easier to, to look at it um, in this way. Okay, um, so here I used head. Um, we don't necessarily have to do that. We can just print out the, the variable like, like we did before with, um, you know, like the A in the first notebook. Um, but because colors is so long, it, it prints out a lot of stuff. Um, so I often just use head so that it it's kind of keeps the notebook a little bit shorter. But it really depends on what you are trying to accomplish. Um, if you really want to see the majority of your data, then you should. So it will truncate it still. If you look in the middle here, it'll do dot, dot, dot. But it's printing out a lot more than you get from head. Um, kind of just up, up to personal preference. Okay. Um, so that's our data. Um, so the, the goal of what we're going to try to do is to, um, to display it as, uh, as a heat map. So again, we have like these, um, these, different, these two different wavelengths um, and then the ratings. And so we actually have for each, um, for each wavelength, or for each, yeah, we have like a list of wavelengths and then um, all of the possible pairs of wavelengths we have a rating for. And so that is something that we could put in matrix form and display it. So just as kind of a, a proof of concept, that's the first thing that we're we first need to actually put it in matrix form. Um, and so to do that, we're going to use a function or method called pivot. Um, and what that does is it says, make the rows um, correspond to the values that are in the column wavelength one, make the columns be the values that are in the column wavelength two, and make the values be the rating. Um, so if I run this cell, you'll see the wavelength one is, on, is in the, the rows, wavelength two is the columns, and then the values are the ratings. Does that make sense? Um, so now we have this in a nice uh, matrix form, um, and we save it in this variable pivoted colors. Um, and so we'll use our first matplotlib function, which is mat show or matrix show. Um, and if we do that, that shows all of our ratings. Any questions so far? So um, this is cool, um, and this is kind of just a proof of concept to show what it looks like to plot something in the notebook, but it's not actually a very useful representation for um, this type of data. Um, I mean, it, it kind of it shows like basically, well, yes, when the, the two things are, when the two wavelengths are the same, we get very high ratings along like the diagonal, but the rest of the matrix is not really interpretable in itself. So what we're gonna actually do is use a technique called MDS to take all of this data and make it two-dimensional data rather than 13-dimensional um, data, 14-dimensional data. Um, does, who, who knows what MDS is? Uh, about half the people. Um, <laughs> a little less than half. <laughs> um, so MDS is, is, you don't have to worry about the details, um, though it's a, it's a great, like really classic Pi-Sci um, algorithm. Uh, basically what it does is, is you have, so you have all of these points and you have distances between all the points, that's these ratings, right? Um, and so what it does is it's going to figure out a way to plot the points um, in two dimensions, x and y, so that the distances between all the points are preserved. 
Um, and this is sort of a really classic um, example of, of showing psychological space. Um, so in the colors domain, so if we run this MDS function, um, that this is something that I just provided for you, but you can, if you're curious how it works, you can do this. This is, again, a, a special Jupyter Notebook thing. You can do this double question marks to um, look at the source of the function. Um, I'm not going to go through what it's doing. It's using a library called scikit-learn to, to, to actually um, do the computation under the hood. But um, when we've done MDS, we get a new data frame now, which has a label, which corresponds to the wavelength, and then the x and the y coordinate, which is in these new two dimensions of our data. And so when we plot it, something that looks like this, where the points are kind of in an oval shape, um, which is cool, but also not very useful because we don't know which point corresponds to which point. Um, uh, here, let me just explain this function before I, I move on further. Again, we're doing plt.plot. So plot is kind of the generic plotting function for plotting lines and points. Um, and then we're taking the x column as our x coordinates, the y column as our y coordinates, and then o is the um, symbol that we're using to actually plot the data. So I could change that to be like um, d or something, and then now, now it's diamonds. Um, uh, so you, you can use whatever you want. O is sort of the canonical one. Um, but okay, so that's not very useful because we don't know which point is which. So what we could do is plot the points um, according to the color that um, so each point corresponds to a different color. Um, and so what we're going to do is, um, uh, or, or um, we're going to do two things. The first thing we're actually going to do is to um, just label them. So here's another matplotlib function called text. And so what you do is you give text, again, an x and y coordinate, and then a string for the label. And what it'll do is it'll add text to the diagram. So here we can see this is wavelength 434, this is 445, this is 674. Um, so that's kind of interesting. We can already see here um, that the, the wavelengths that are close to each other in wavelength space tend to be close to each other in this um, perceptual similarity space, except 674 and 434 are also reasonably close to each other. Um, we can like see why this is actually is so I mean, here's another data set which is the RGBA values of the wavelengths um, so that's the actual colors that we can use to um, show what colors these are and so what we're going to do is again plot the x and y values of each point but then we'll set the color using this color keyword argument um, to the, the color uh, that we've loaded from this new data set so when we do that we see that the colors look like this. And so you can kind of see what's going on here. What, what the MDS algorithm is doing is it's showing, well, people see that the like blue is, is more similar to red than it is to yellow. Um, and if we had uh, purple colors in here, you would see that they probably would be in that gap between the blues and the reds. Um, using that label. Um, so that's just that's kind of a demonstration of a, a few different things that you can um, do with matplotlib. You can um, plot matrices, you can plot points. Um, you can plot text to label those different points, and you can you know, change the colors of the points too. Um, so just to get sort of familiarize you with, with how this works, um, we have another little exercise here, which is do exactly the same thing we just did, but using a different data set called kinship, kinship similarities. Um, so what you're going to do is uh, you won't be able to plot the actual colors because kinships don't have colors. These are things like kinship relations with mother, father, grandmother, etc. Um, but just um, load in the data set, do MDS on it, um, and then plot it, and then label each point with the, the corresponding label, like whether it's the point corresponding to mother or father or whatever. Um, so you can you can copy and paste a lot of the code from, from earlier in the notebook to accomplish this. And let's see, let's maybe try to do work until 10:40 on this one, so 10 minutes. And remember, if you get stuck, feel free to put up a sticky note. <coughs>
Um, so that's why I chose to do it here, because then I can create this in just one, one line of code. Um, but we can do other things too. Like, so now if we want to add labels to this plot, we again run our for loop to add labels, and they've been added to the plot on the fly interactively like that. Um, and you'll notice here, instead of doing PLT, we're doing AX, which is our axis object, which is telling it, apply these operations as opposed to, um, you know, I could create a new plot like fig2, AX2. Um, now, and then I could do, uh, let's see, oops. let's do um, plot our X and Y values again. AX2 plot. Um, so it, it just created something there, but then I could also still go and do AX dot like um, set title uh, MBS colors. And now if I went back up to figure one, it has an MBS color. So that's just if you were to do PLT, basically what it does is it only does the operation on the most recently created plot. So if I had done PLT before, if both of these were with um, both of these here, AX2 and AX1, if those were both PLT, they both would have operated on this plot rather than one on this one and one on the other one. Um, so that's why I prefer using this like AX dot syntax rather than the PLT syntax. But if the PLT is easier for you to use for right now, that's fine. You should use kind of whatever is, um, you know, you, you feel most comfortable with. So, um, so that's like uh, kind of cool because it means we can sort of build up our plots on the fly and if, you know, rather than just creating the whole thing all at once, we can create it kind of bit by bit. Um, in general, I would say like once you have a finished notebook, you should try to put all of the code to create your plot in the same cell um, because otherwise it can get a little bit confusing as to how the plot got created. If the plot is up here and then the code to like create it is after the plot. So I, I like this this would be sort of this cell here would be a better way of doing it after you've kind of figured out the right way to create your plot where it just everything all at once in the same cell. Um, but it is it does uh, make it handy for kind of creating things on the fly and and as we'll see later when we get to that plot of animations in the advanced section, this is what allows us to create animations using that plot. Um, we can also do things like uh, using this interactive mode. We can um, do things like pan around. So if I click on this uh, this like crosshairs um, button, it allows to pan the image around, which is a little slow and clunky, but it's. Um, it, it, it is nice to be able to do that rather than just having a static image. Um, even more cool is, is that we can also do this using 3D plots. Um, so if we come back up to this, you'll see I imported this thing called Axis 3D. We're not actually going to use that variable, but you have to import it in order to create a 3D plot. Um, so if I come and I say, um, so we're just going to generate some data and then um, and just as a side note, this is a NumPy array. This is array format. Um, so this is an example of NumPy kind of being used under the hood. Um, and now, when we create our subplots, we're going to pass in this thing. That, so subplot underscore key w, that stands for keywords, equals, and then in the dictionary, we're going to tell it projection equals 3D. And then when we use scatter, we pass in all three um, dimensions of our data. Um, as well as uh, colors that got returned when we generated the data set. And it takes a moment. And there's our data. This is called, this is a sort of a, one of the standard data sets that you might encounter. It's called the Swiss roll data set um, because it looks like a Swiss roll cake. Um, <laughs> and it is It's a little bit slower on the projector. There we go. So you can rotate it and then view it from different angles. It, it, hopefully it's a little faster for you than it is for me. Normally it's a bit faster than this. Um, but I think it's because I'm on the... It, it might either be the Wi-Fi or it might be because I'm on the projector. I'm not sure. But that, that, this is nice for if you have a 3D data set. Using that polyp interactively allows you to sort of um, you know, rotate around your data and view it um, from different angles more easily than you'd be able to if it was just a static plot. Um, and then, uh, so that's kind of just a taste of, of using Matplotlib interactively. There's no exercise for this notebook because it's, it's really very similar to how you do the other types of plotting. Um, I'll just note, note at, here at the end um, when you might want to use inline versus notebook. So I use both, and 
So when I'm creating plots, for example, to include in a paper, I often use inline because um, you kind of get a better sense of like what it's going to look like when you actually save that figure and and put it um, like in your in your PDF for your uh, for your paper. Um, and I use notebook more like the notebook backend, not college notebook, more in an interactive exploratory way. So typically I'll use notebook more towards the beginning of my like. You know, after just after I've collected the data to try to get a sense of what the data looks like and stuff, and then as I get closer and closer to actually creating the publication, um, I'll switch over to using inline because that that's a little bit more of like a final um, a final preview of what it, what it's going to look like. Um, so, any questions about this? Okay. Um, so we're going to um, now go back through our last notebook, and then we'll take a break after this before going into um, the advanced. Okay, so um, this is going to just be a very, um, I'm not going to really talk about like how to do statistical modeling, it's just going to be a very quick overview of, of um, how you might do it and like, the syntax that you might need to be able to do it um, in uh, uh, this package called stats models, um, which pandas and stats models are kind of like developed they're not developed by the same people, but they're developed very closely together. So um, you can do a lot of things with stats models if you're using pandas that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do if you were using like NumPy or something. Um, and and uh, stats models uses a syntax that's very similar to our syntax. So uh, in the later tutorials, um, people are going to go through um, how to do some of this stuff in R too. So this will give you a bit of a comparison for how, how you might do both of them. Uh, and so we're going to just use a data set just to, to sort of demonstrate what you can do. This is from um, a paper of mine um, where we had this task in which people saw this ball bouncing around in this box and they had to predict whether the ball would go through the hole or not. Um, and we, we were looking at how like if we changed the location of the hole and the size of the hole, how that might change people's response times. Um, and so in, in this notebook, we're going we're gonna to look at some of that data. Um, look at how um, people's response times might vary as a, as a function of, of that whole. Um, okay, so our first cell is again um, the uh, imports. So we're importing map, uh, pandas again, matplotlib. We're going to use matplotlib inline here, um, but feel free to change that to notebook if you prefer. Um, NumPy, um, and we're also going to use a package called SciPy, uh, which is useful for um, uh, solve, it has some kind of basic statistics statistical functions in it, uh, but then especially stats models, um, which stats models kind of has a lot of imports. You usually have to import a lot of things from stats models. Um, so we're going to use two imports here, and then I'm going to break my rule and do a few more imports later down in the notebook, but um, it, you'll see why. Okay. So we'll run that. Um, the data set is in this file ball.csv, so we'll load that in. And you'll see, um, so we have in one column is the participant ID, um, uh, one column is the stimulus ID, uh, one column is the, the width of the hole, one column is the class of the hole. So as I mentioned, we changed like, the position of the hole. We changed it so that the hole would either go um, directly in the center of the hole, in the hole but at like the very edge, miss the hole but at the very edge, or miss the hole by a far margin. So that's what the hole class specifies. Um, we had different conditions just to spread out all the trials across different participants, but you don't need to worry about that too much. Um, this is the trial number. Um, goes in, says whether the ball actually went in the hole or not. Um, number of bounces is how many times the ball bounced before going in the hole. Um, response is what, what the participant said, and RT is their response time. Um, and this data was collected using SciTurk, which Todd is going to talk about later. Uh, so just to, um, all of this stuff is together. Um, okay, so that's the data set. Um, so what, what types of things might we want to do with this data set? Well, um, one thing you might want to do is to, to actually just look at a subset of the data. Um, so for example, we could say, let's, we only want to look at trials in which the ball actually went in the hole. Um, Pandas makes that really easy using this query method. So you just do, um, you have your data frame, and you do .query, and then you can write basically any conditional that you want. Um, and this one we're doing goes in equals equals true. Um, but you could also do, like, let's say, um, uh, data.query RT is greater than 200. Um, or this is actually in seconds, not in milliseconds. So let's do RT is greater than 0.2. And that would give us all the trials in which the RT is greater than 0.2. 
Um, we can combine them, we can do and RT is less than um, 5, uh, etc. Or and um, whole width equals equals 200. And now we have only whole width equals 200. So you could use this query to kind of really quickly um, uh, pull out different subsets of your data for looking at um, uh, uh, very easily. Let's do just a head here. Okay, and then what we might want to do is visualize some of this data. So um, let's, for example, look at a histogram of response times. Um, now, uh, so this hist so this is also a case where pandas is um, working with Matplotlib. Uh, so what we're doing are our, our, we do it goes in. So this is all the trials in which the log goes in the whole. We're looking just at the response time column, and then we do dot hist. So normally what we would do would be like plt dot hist goes in. T, um, like that, but rather than doing that, we're just um, calling it on the pandas object, and that's nice because sometimes pandas will will be able to infer some things about your data and provide you with some nicer labels and stuff. Um, it's not doing that in this case, but it does that sometimes. Um, we can see from this plot that we have some pretty big outliers um, because it automatically set the the x-axis limit to be up to 70, um, and we can verify that by looking at so we, again, pull out our response time column and then look at the maximum value. And our maximum value is, in fact, 72.2247. So I guess that participant walked away from their computer in the middle of a trial or something. Um, that's like a minute and a half uh, response time. So uh, what we can do is uh, pull out, um, you know, like exclude all the outliers from our data and just take the 99% confidence interval or the 99% range of um, trials centered around the median. So again, to do this, um, we're going to use a numpy function called np.percentile. We give it the response times, and we say, um, give me from like 0.5% to 99.5%. And then we query our data using the same way that we were doing it before, um, but passing in these low and high values. Um, and then now, if we, if we uh, again query those trials that, that it goes in, and then compute the histogram, we see a, a, much, a much more reasonable range of values. Um, okay, so um, we're going to do a quick exercise um, just to familiarize you with the query method and for doing these types of visualizations. So I just want you to um, query um, that data variable um, for uh, the, t the types of trials where the ball missed the hole um, by a small margin. So that's called uh, close, uh, close miss, that's the trial type. Um, and then and that it bounced once, so that would be num bounces equals one and then visualize the response times using Instagram. Um, so we'll just take five minutes to do that, um, so until, say, 10.53.
questions?
Uh, we're not going to do it by hand, but pandas gives us a way to do it very easily, which is this group by operation. Um, so what it's going to do is it's going to say, um, to turn this data frame into separate data frames um, that are uh, where each subset is a unique combination of stimulus, full width, and full class. Um, and then what we can do is take from each of those different subsets one column, like the response column, and then compute the mean of it. Um, and so if we do this, what we'll see is now, after running this code, we have a unique stimuli, full width, and full class, and then a value, and that's the average response value. Um, you can take a look at what um, groups there are. So uh, by doing, you can do this same group by operation. And then I think the value is groups. Yeah, so this, this actually Um, the standard error, uh, the median, etc. Well, we could write a little function for ourselves, um, which I have here called calcstats. And what this takes is a group. Um, so one of the groups that is, is pulled out of this data frame, and then it computes a bunch of different statistics on that group. Um, so group.mean, group.median, group.standard, and that's the standard deviation. Um, this is a scipy function that create, uh, computes the standard error of the mean. Um, and then it creates a series object, which is, we've been working with pandas data frames this whole time, but a single column of a data frame is called a series. Um, and so what we're doing is we're creating basically just a single column where the, the index of that column, the rows, are called mean, median, standard, and uh, SEM. And so then, so we create this series, um, we give it a name, uh, and then we return it. And so now if we do the same group by operation, but we apply this new function, calc stats, to it. Like this one line, we've, we've managed to compute a whole bunch of different things. Um, and now we have all of those stats at our fingertips. Questions about that? Kind of, these operations are a little bit complicated and there's a lot going on, so sometimes it takes a little, you have to kind of stare at them for a little bit to, uh, to get what's entirely going on, but once you do that enough and once you sort of get the hang of using these, it makes data analysis so fast and so quick because you're able to do so much with um, you know, so little code, basically. Okay, so we're gonna do uh, another uh, exercise here. Um, which is just to do another group by operation, uh, where you're going to do uh, grouping, group it by the number of bounces, the whole size of the whole class, and then compute the mean response time of each of those groups. Um, so that should be, uh, you should be able to use, uh, where is it? Um, 
this one, the mean, mean rest, you should be able to sort of use this as a template for how to do that. And we'll take um, just, we're running a little bit behind time, so let's just take um, five minutes to do that, and then we'll quickly go through the rest of it. Data object again. 
five, um, we do group five. Um, similarly, as what we did before, it, we're using different columns, but it's, it's just, uh, you basically, with group five, you can select any column that you want. So before, where we did stem, whole width, and whole class, we did something very similar, but we're using num bounces instead of stem. Um, and then after doing the group by operation, we select the response time column, and then we compute the mean from that. And that gives us our, our mean value. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go through the rest of this pretty quickly because we should have a little bit of time for a break. And then I, I, there's a few advanced topics that I want to talk about. Um, sorry, I have a little bit more content than we have time to get through. Um, but some of, some of this stuff, I'm not going to take so much time with it because you're going to see a lot of the same types of things when we go through R later. Um, so uh, basically, um, uh, so, so just a few more operations we can do with data frames. Um, uh, we can, so here, once we have our, um, you know, we've computed these multiple statistics on the data frames, so we now have, this is our rest stats variable, we have mean, medium, SEM, and standard. Um, we can now say, say we wanted to like pull out just one of those values. Um, well, we could, you know, do our query thing, there's a few other ways that we can do it too. So, let's see, sorry, I'm scrolling around a lot. Um, let's take just a look at REST stats again. So, this is actually a series. This is one of the interesting things about pandas is that um, you can have series like column objects, but where the index, the rows, have multiple levels. So, here we have an index that has four levels one for stem stimulus, one for whole width, one for whole class, and one for statistics. Um, and then the values are the actual value of the column. So this is just a column in its own right. Um, we can turn it back into a data frame by um, using this two-frame method. And then the value that we pass it is basically the name that we want to make this column. So you see this is looking exactly the same. The index is still the same. You can tell because the, the labels for the index are a little bit lower. But then now this is a data frame with one column called value. Um, we can now, um, if we wanted to get these um, values of the index back to columns rather than being parts of the index itself, we use this reset index method. Um, and that will give us now back, we have like just a regular data frame with a bunch of columns and the index isn't really useful at all. So we can sort of convert back and forth between these um, these different ways of using pandas data frames, where sometimes it's useful to have these values as the index, and sometimes it's useful to have them as columns. So from here now, we can query for the mean statistic, um, and now we just have the mean. If if we had tried to do this, but if we tried to do this before doing all of these operations, what would have happened is we get an error because if we take a look at risk stats again. The, the statistic isn't a column, it's part of the index. And so when we do this query method, it's only actually querying columns, not rows. Um, <coughs> so that, that doesn't work. So we have, basically, that's the reason for, for doing this thing where we, we turn this part of the index back into a column, and then that allows us to query for the value. Um, if we wanted to put the columns back in the index, we can use that using the um, set index uh, method. So here we are doing what we did before. We turn it into a data frame with a column or value. We then make all of the columns, or all of the indices columns. We query this for the mean, and then we set the other columns back to be in the index. Um, that's kind of a, a roundabout way of doing this, because we're taking all the rows, making them columns, and then making them rows again. Um, a better way to do it would be um, we can just reset one column so we take one part of the index, make it a column, and then we can just query that. So that's what's going on here, is we just reset the statistic column and then query that. And we get the same thing where all the other column, all the other row levels are still part of the index rather than being real columns. Um, so it can be a little bit confusing what's like part of the index versus what's a column. Um, but the, using this sort of visual cue helps a lot, the ones that are low are part of the index, and the ones that are higher are part of our actual columns. Um, another, another operation we can do is to um, 
turn, so if you remember we did this pivot thing before where we took um, like one column and made, or one, uh, we took the values in one column and made those the columns of a new data frame. Um, that's kind of a, a one version of a type of operation that you can do called unstacking. Um, so if we take again a look at uh, REST stats, um, we can unstack our statistics. So we take this um, column from the index and we turn it into columns of a new data frame. That will give us now one column for each of mean, medium, SEM, and SP. Um, and, and so then from here we can select these just as columns. So we can select the mean column and um, now, now we've done basically the same thing as we had done before with the query operation, just in a, a different way. Um, we can also select multiple columns, so for example, mean and standard deviation, um, and we can, you know, like unstack, select those columns, and then stack again, and now this is, it has given us an index of just mean standard deviation. So that's kind of like the types of things that you can do with this. Um, and then, and just as the last part of this, um, we can also then do statistics on these data frames using stats models. Um, and so, like I said, I'm going to go quickly through this just because um, you'll see the same types of things in R um, later. Um, but we can, so for example, if we want to do an analysis on our log response times, which are often like more normally distributed, so um, we're going to take our response times and then create log response times, a new column. There's, there's a new column of log response times. Um, we can create a histogram again um, just to see that it is not exactly normally distributed, but it is sort of bell-shaped. Um, and then, um, you know, we can do other types of things like create a QQ plot. This is something um, that you'll probably see again later in, in R, how you would do it in R. Um, and then to actually create a linear model, uh, we can use the stats models uh, package that I talked about earlier, um, SMF, and then this is for ordinary least squares, OLS. Um, and then this is the um, formula uh, where sort of saying make a model that predicts log response times out of um, the variables whole class and whole width, and um, that will give us, uh, you know, our, our the values of the coefficients for this linear model, um, and we can also then do things like ANOVAs on top of that, um, where we can now see that like all of these are all of the whole class whole width and the interaction between them are significant predictors of log response times. Um, okay. That was a very, very quick overview of that. Um, if you didn't get all that, that's no worries because I went really, really fast. Um, we're not going to do this exercise, but feel free to do it on your own. Um, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Let's take um, a, I know we're supposed to take a 15 minute break, but I'm going to say a 10 minute break um, because I, I, there's, a, there's two notebooks that I really want to go through um, before we end uh, for lunch. So, okay, 10 minutes.
Yeah, well, I'm, I think I'm supposed to be here, but um, uh, I guess I don't really know. I assume that's the first Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. I guess I'll probably I'll be around. I'll have to go to the workshop, so. Um, Are you guys able to figure out the audio? Uh, yeah, okay. I think it's just because of the internet. Uh, so it's just like some kind of delay. Sure. Uh, it's just coming in and out. It's not for my end. My end is good. It's on right now. I am. Um, it's an incompatibility with this particular setup and the map. So, hopefully. Uh, Alex? Sure. Ha <laughs> ha. 
So, in the remainder of this tutorial, since we only have 20 minutes, um, we're like, okay, so we went through this basics folder, we went through everything in that folder. Um, we're now going to, if you come back to this uh, Hamburg Introduction to Jupyter folder in the main file list, if you click on the advanced folder, um, we're now going to not go through all of these. I'm going to tell you what each notebook is about, um, so that if you're interested in going deeper into that particular topic, you can check out that notebook later. Um, we're only going to go through a couple of them since we don't have very much time, but this should hopefully at least give you a flavor of what sorts of things are possible in the notebook, um, and you know, like, you know, serve as a starting point for you to explore that further and, and learn more on your own. So um, the first notebook uh, covers how to create nicer looking plots in Matplotlib um, so that you can actually include them in a publication. Um, we're not going to go through that one uh, because it's kind of a lot of Matplotlib nitty gritty and I think it, it's kind of just stuff that you can look at on your own. But if you're interested in sort of creating the entire plot from starting from your data and ending with the, the actual file for your plot, um, if you're interested in that workflow, um, you can check out that, that notebook. The second one, um, which we are going to quickly go through, is how to create animations with that plotlet. Um, uh, this is sort of another form of interactivity that is uh, uh, nice to do in the notebook for exploring your data. Um, and then also, we're going to go through interactive analysis with widgets. Um, both of those we're going to uh, go through just very quickly, probably only spend five minutes on each. Um, Interleaving Python and R is something else that I want to get get to um, because I think uh, you know part of this workshop is you're going to learn a lot about R and how to do stuff in R Studio and you might be left feeling with you know do I have to choose Python versus R and the answer is no you don't you can use both at the same time um, we'll see how to do that in that notebook um, and then finally one of the great things about the notebook is that you can use it to actually create publications in the notebook itself so you can. Um, use, export the notebook to HTML, um, and, you know, put it on your blog. Um, that's something that I've done a number of times to create both blog posts and um, I sort of kept like a, when I did my quals about a year and a half ago, I, I kept a log of all of the stuff I was reading in my quals and I, I created a few notebooks um, and exported them to uh, Markdown format so that I could actually display them as part of my quals um, list or quals notebook. Um, so uh, we're not going to go into detail on that one either, um, but it's there if you're curious about how to do that. So um, let's start with the animations in Matplotlib. Um, so this is, again, going to use this Matplotlib notebook backend um, that we saw before. And what we're going to show here is uh, just a very simple um, neural network model called a perceptron. Um, and we're going to visualize what it looks like as the perceptron is learning how to classify some data points. That we have are you could think of them as like you know we're trying to um, learn how to classify cats and dogs and so we get some data and maybe like um, uh, our data is two dimensional so maybe one dimension corresponds to like the size of the animal and the other one corresponds to the shape of its ears or something like that and so we want to learn um, based on those two pieces of information whether it's a cat or a dog um, and then whether it's a cat or a dog is specified by zeros and ones so that's our y's the y's are our labels of cat or dog, and the X are the, the features that we're using to do the classification. So um, the actual code that does the classification is, is we're importing that from this um, NN file. If you were curious, you can come back here and take a look at it um, in nn.py, but I'm not going to go into details about it. Um, uh, so we uh, create our perceptron, we're going to train it for 250 iterations. <coughs> Um, and so what we want to do is first visualize what our data looks like and what the perceptron is doing um, initially. So what we do is um, we're going to create uh, our subplots. We're going to create one that shows the training error and one that shows our data set that we're trying to classify along with the decision boundary for the neural network. Um, and so then this, is, this kind of shows a little bit again why we like to, to do this um, you know, create first the figure and the axis objects using plt.subplots rather than using plt over and over. So we, on axis one, we're going to plot our error line, which at the beginning is zero because we haven't done any training yet. Um, and then we'll set a few things about it, like the um, axis limits, so that's x lim and y lim, and then set some labels so that we can actually interpret it. And then for the other plot, we're going to create a scatter plot again of our x data um, with the colors corresponding to whether it's classified as a cat or a dog. So we're just going to use red and blue for that. 
Um, and then our, this perceptron object that we created up here um, has um, what's called a, a decision boundary. It has that variable associated with it. And so we're going to just plot a line for that decision boundary so that we can see on one side of the decision boundary, it's classifying things one way, and on the other side, it's classifying things the other way. So if we just run this code, this is what it looks like initially. So again, no training error because we haven't started training yet. Um, these blue and red points are our training data, and then this black line is the perceptron's decision boundary, which is currently not very meaningful. Um, and so now what we're going to do is we've created this interactive plot. So if you remember from before how we were able to sort of change the plot as we went along um, after having created it, we're going to do exactly the same thing here. So um, for each of our training loops, we're going to um, first uh, call perceptron.train, which will tell it to update its weights so that it, it does a little bit better at doing this classification. And this function returns an error. So our training errors. So we keep track of our training errors. And then if you come back to when we first created our plot, you'll notice we took the output of this ax.plot command and we set it to a variable called error line. So this is actually a variable that corresponds to the line in the plot. And so now what we can do is edit that line, tell it to change the data that it is using on the fly. So here we're going to do error line .set x data, and then we're going to use just a range of integers for the number of like for the training iterations we've done. Um, and then we're going to set the y data to be the, the actual error that we've computed. Um, and then similarly, we've, we, the perceptron, after calling perceptron.train, has updated this decision boundary. And so we're going to set the x data and the y data for the normal line, um, the classification boundary, which we created when we um, plotted this. So if I run this code, oh, and then um, at the very end, we tell that problem to actually update the drawing. Um, big dot canvas dot draw. If you left this line out, it wouldn't actually redraw anything. So that's an important line to have. So if we run that, and then I scroll up, you can see it is uh, doing that loop training the perceptron, and as it's doing that, the training error is going down, and the, the decision boundary is changing, so that it's, you know, you can see it's not perfectly separating the red points from the blue points, but it's almost doing it, um, because it's, uh, it, it's not a perfectly separable data set, but um, this is going pretty slow. I don't exactly know why it's, it's usually a bit faster than this, but um, that's the general idea of how you can create an animation. And this is, so this is particularly useful if you're doing modeling work because you can, if you need to train your model, um, you can do something like this, throw up a quick animation to watch um, your model's performance improve as you're creating it um, to get a sense of whether you actually have like created your model correctly. Um, so this is something that I, I use quite frequently in my own research to kind of try to visualize um, how, how my own models are, are working with respect to my data sets. Um, and so there's an exercise here which I, we're not going to do now, but you can try to, to do it later if you want. Um, uh, this is just a suggestion of how to create an animation where it's actually displaying the weights of the perceptron and how they're changing over time rather than um, displaying the decision boundary and the training. Um, so you can do that on your own if you're curious, if you feel like. Okay, so let's um, stop this. So I'm going to interrupt the kernel, but I'll tell it to stop plotting stuff, hopefully. Maybe not. Uh, it, it's almost done. So let's move on to um, our third notebook, which is Interactive Analysis with Widgets, which uses a lot of the same ideas that we just used now. So um, widgets, the this, um, the plots, the interactive matplotlib plots are actually kind of a form of widget. Um, and there's a more general class of widgets that we import from IPy widgets um, that we can use to interactively explore our data in, in other ways. So for example, um, uh, if, let's say we have um, a function called square, which just squares the value that we give it. It's not a very interesting function, but it's that's sort of um, we're just going to use it as a proof of concept. Now, with widgets, what we can do is turn it into an interactive function where we can dynamically on the fly change the input value of x. So um, we call this interact function. We pass it the function square. And then we tell it what is the range of x that x can be. And so we're going to say it can go from negative 10 to 10 um, and at steps of 0.1. So we do that. And this gives us a little slider now that we can change. And as you change the slider, 
um, you see the value of the output of square changing dynamically too. Um, so that's really simple and not very useful because like that's not a very interesting function. Um, but the, it can be used for a lot more things and it can be really, really powerful. Um, just to show you one other way of doing this, it, you can also create widgets more like on the fly like this where you, this is called a decorator if you haven't seen the syntax before. Basically the same interact function but then you put an at sign in front of it and, and you do that right before you define the function and then it's equivalent to, to doing this. So if I run this now, I again get our interactive um, x value uh, or squared x value. Okay. So that's the basics of how widgets work, but they're really nice, especially when you use them in conjunction with plots. So for example, um, if we wanted to look at how uh, maybe a random variable distribution changes as a result of its parameters, um, so for example, the normal distribution, we can create a widget to visualize that. So here we're uh, creating just a simple plot. We're doing the same thing that we did before with the animation where we, um, you know, we save the, val the value of this ax.plot um, and then here when we change our parameters at the normal distribution, we set the x and y data of that line. Um, and here we're again using scipy to compute the value of that normal distribution, um, which is parameterized by mu and sigma. And so we do that, we get our, our plot, See if I can zoom out a bit because I can't see everything on the screen at once. Okay. Here, now if I change mu, it'll cause the distribution to change. The, this is just showing that mu represents the mean of the distribution and sigma as the um, how like peaked it is. Uh, and so if you if if you ever are working with like uh, you know probabilities and you're not really quite sure how those probabilities are changing. Um, or your model predictions, how they're changing as a result of, or as a function of the input, um, you can, or the parameters, you can create widgets like this on the fly to kind of visualize how things are changing. And this is really, really a powerful thing that you can do. So here's another one. This is a beta distribution, which probably less of you are familiar with than the normal distribution. So what's the beta distribution? Well, it's parameterized by alpha and beta. Um, what do alpha and beta do? Well, they shift the distribution around between zero and one. So if I change beta, um, you can see it gets closer and closer to zero. If I change alpha down, it continues to get closer and closer to zero, but if I move alpha up, it gets back to the center. So it's basically sort of like, um, the more different alpha and beta are, the more skewed the distribution is, and the closer that they are to each other, the more centered the distribution is. So you can use these sorts of widgets in this way to kind of get these types of intuitions about um, your data sets or your models or, or whatever you want. Um, and we can create even more complex types of widgets too. So um, to take our bouncing ball data set that we were working with before, um, let's say we, you know, rather than doing all of this querying by hand and, and like looking at it just as the output of a cell, we could build a widget to allow us to um, more interactively query the data set. So here I've just built a little widget that plots a distribution of responses in response times as a function of different stimulus. So, um, I could change the stimulus and it'll here um, cause the distributions to be plotted, change the whole width, and this is, this is all the code I needed to, to make that happen. Um, most of this is the plotting code rather than anything else. Um, so widgets kind of allow you to really quickly build up these really sophisticated interfaces that allow you to interactively explore stuff in your data. Um, Okay, so uh, again, I'm not going to go through the exercise because I want to get to this last um, Python and R notebook because I think this is one of the, out of all of the things that I'm talking to you about today, I think this is one of the ones that you should remember the most because um, because this workshop is all about both Python and R, I think this is one of the, like, the most useful things that you might get to take away from this, uh, which is that, so I personally, in my own workflows, find it very useful to use Python to do all of the, the dirty work, so like loading in the data, um, cleaning it, like doing basically what's called data munching, um, uh, doing all of my model, like if I have any sophisticated modeling, I do that all in Python, but then if I want to do statistical data analysis, R is by far like the better option for that. It has a lot more packages available, um, and it can just do a much more powerful things than, than it currently exists in Python. Um, but then that's unfortunate because I don't really want to have to like do all my data analysis or do all my data processing in Python, save it to a file, go into R, load the file. Like that's just kind of a pain to do. So, um, you know, 
if you were going to have to do that, you might as well just do it all in one language versus the other. But luckily, in the notebook, we don't have to do that. Um, we can um, use what's called RPy2, um, which is the R Python integration library. Um, and this gives us something called the R magic, which um, you use by percent percent R. And then if you do that percent percent R, you can run R code in a Python notebook. Um, now, this is cool. Um, like, I mean, just doing this is nice in, in and of its own, but it also allows us to pass values back and forth between Python and R. So there's another version of the R magic where we just do a single percent R, and we do it on just a single line. And what this will do is it'll run all of this R code, the stuff that's on the right hand side of the percent R, and it'll return it as a variable that we can then use to store in a Python variable called R. Maybe I should have used a different term for that. R, R. <laughs> so, so here we have a Python variable called ARR that was created in the R programming language. Um, and so we can do a lot more than just um, passing variables, you know, passing like single, like tiny arrays like this back and forth. We can pass entire data frames and stuff too. And R has its own version of data frames. So let's load our ball data set again. Um, and so here what we're going to do is we're going to create um, this is uh, the equivalent linear model that I created in the, um, before when we were looking at the stats model stuff that we went through very quickly, but now I'm doing it in R instead. And so what I'm doing is I'm doing dash i to pass in as input the data variable, doing this linear model in R um, on that data variable. And so here we get some R print out, um, and now you'll see this is like the way that R reports its, its modeling results. Um, we can similarly do with the ANOVA in R rather than in Python. We can get the values back in Python. So let's say we want to get the results of this ANOVA as a data frame in Python. We can do dash O result um, because that's what, we, um, that's what we're going to store it as in, in R. So we uh, create an R variable called result and we send it back to Python using the R magic. When we get it, it's not in the most useful format. Um, it says it's an R object. It's great, it's not very useful, but we imported at the top this r2pi function to convert it to a Kansas data frame. So we can now um, do whatever we want with this. So I, for example, will a lot of times create my, well, we don't care about ggplot, which I hear is awesome, but I haven't really used it myself. So I use, I think on my plots in that plotlet, what I do is I will do the analysis in R, um, get the statistical results, back in Python and then use that to figure out like you know where I should plot like asterisks on my bar plots and stuff like that. Um, and you can similarly also do plotting in R though if you prefer to do that. Um, so for example here we can create a QQ plot in R and it's just like a Python plot that gets displayed in the notebook along with everything else. Um, so it's really really powerful to be able to weave R and Python code back and forth like that. Um, and basically, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people say like, oh, this, you know, Python is the best programming language, or R is like the best language, and it's not true, there's no one best programming language, they all have their different strengths and weaknesses, and so one of the things that is like really the best thing about the notebook is it, it doesn't make you stick with one language, you can do stuff in multiple languages and use whatever language is most um, well suited to the particular task that you're trying to accomplish at the moment. Okay. So I know that went by really fast, but I'm happy to like answer any questions or anything during lunch um, or at any other time during the rest of the workshop. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks. I think we have two minutes, so if you have any questions now, I'll say sitting here. <laughs> Um, do the widgets only work with the matplotlib in notebook mode, or can I be also in book? Um, does the do the widgets only work on matplotlib in notebook mode, or can I use other libraries or the other image mode in matplotlib? Yeah, you can. So the widgets themselves like are not tied to oh, um, not tied to matplotlib at all. Um, uh, just as you saw, like here, you can create this slider with X um, that doesn't involve a plot. Um, you can really use any other type of plotting that you want. You sometimes like so the there's one issue is that how the plot gets updated is Matplotlib has kind of some special integration with the widgets so that uh, it, it when you actually slide these widgets, it, normally what it does is it, it clears all the outputs and 
then for the, what the widget does is it clears all the outputs and then redraws them. But Matplotlib has kind of a special integration with the widget so that it doesn't do that. Um, so you, and that, I mean, but I used to actually use, before they got that special integration, I used to only use the inline Matplotlib and then it just is kind of slower to change the widget because it has to like redraw the entire plot every single time. But you certainly can do that. Um, so I don't know about other types of plotting libraries, like Plotly or whatever. I'm not sure how well those integrate with widgets, but I think that they also have special integration so that it works in this like. I have 30 more minutes. Oh, I felt much started at 12. Six talking. Oh, okay. Well, um, okay, great. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, like, let's do uh, let's do a poll here on in terms of um, so the options are you can work on whatever you want to work on, and I'm happy to kind of walk around and just like answer questions. Um, we can go through quickly these other two notebooks um, that I didn't talk about before, the reproducible plots and exporting the notebook to other formats. Um, I can go back through some of the stuff that we talked about before in more detail. Um, uh, I guess let's. Who would like just um, free exercise time and I'll walk around and answer questions? Raise your hand. Who would like to go through the two notebooks if you haven't seen yet? And who would like me to go back through an, other, an old topic that we put in more detail? Okay, I think um, the majority would prefer me to go through these two notebooks, so I'll do that. Um, and then chances are we might still have a little bit of extra time at the end, um, maybe like 10 minutes or so, so then we could uh, maybe go back through something or I'll just answer more questions and we'll do for that. So, oh, I'm so happy that we have an extra three minutes. Um, okay, so let's um, start with our reproducible plots in that plot list. Um, and this, this notebook also doesn't have any exercises. This is kind of more of just a demonstration of what you can do. Um, and you can also do a lot of these same things within um, like ggplot, which I think you'll hear about later in R. So it's really kind of up to you which which um, format you prefer, and I hear a lot of people do prefer R, but I'm personally a Matplotlib fan at heart, so um, I'm going to show you how to do it in Matplotlib. So, uh, okay, again, we'll run our import statements, um, and uh, in this this uh, notebook, we're going to use a different data set. Um, so this is another um, data set of mine where we were looking at uh, human-robot collaboration, and basically we, um, I, I should have included an a image here of what it, what the task looked like, just to give you a sense. But we had basically, um, see if I can maybe draw on this other side. I'll turn it back around and you guys need to watch my stuff again later. Um, but the, the task was basically, you have like a human avatar here, and a robot avatar, and you're trying to complete a set of tasks together, like that look like this. And some of the tasks are single agent tasks, like this one, and some of them are double agent tasks. So like the idea is you and the robot need to uh, both, like so you maybe would come get this one, and the robot would come get this one, and then you would both go and get this task, and then you would also both go and get that task. And so we were looking at um, what some of the things that we were looking at was like how much um, the robot was actually helping, so how many tasks were getting completed by the robot rather than sort of forcing the human to, to complete all of the tasks themselves. Um, um, and so that's the data set that we're going to be looking at here, um, just to give you a sense of what it actually is. So here in our task data, we have, um, again, our participant ID. I usually use the ID as the that column. Um, we, we had a few different conditions where we used different robot algorithms to figure out like which tasks they would go to. Um, so we had one called fixed, one called predicted, and one called reactive. And um, the, I'm not going to really go into the details as to how they differ, but basically the fixed robot did everything and ignored that the human was there. Um, the predictive robot tried to predict what the human was going to do and then act based on that. And the reactive robot um, would, would pay attention to the human, but then only change its behavior if it saw the human was doing something that was surprising to it. Um, and then we also had a few different um, inference methods, but you don't have to really worry about those, uh, those different things. 
the important thing is like, the difference between the task, the number of tasks that the human completed, the number of tasks that the robot completed, the number of tasks that they completed together, and then total tasks is how many tasks there were total. So, um, so we want to create a plot that, that shows the differences between um, these different numbers of tasks for these different robot and inference conditions. So um, as a first attempt, uh, we can again do a group by operation by robot and inference type and look at the number of tasks that the robot is completing, or the average number of tasks that the robot is completing, and we get a data frame that, or a series object that looks something like that. Um, so to create a plot that visualizes this, we're going to create a bar plot. Um, uh, so here we'll do ax.bar, and then we'll also display a line that shows the, the total number of tasks, which is 39, um, just to get a sense of the proportion. Um, so if we do this, we get something that looks like this, where we each bar is now labeled according to, um, we did this here by setting the x ticks and the x tick labels to say, like, um, this is the fixed robot with the Bayesian inference method, this is the fixed robot with the Oracle inference method, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's not really a very nice plot, and it's not something that you want to include in a publication. Um, so how do we make it nicer? Well, there's a bunch of steps we'll go through. But the first one, and the best one, is something called Seaborn, which is a library that uh, allows you to make more sophisticated plots that look nicer than default matplotlib. Um, and it just does it automatically. So if we import Seaborn as SNS, is the, again, the canonical import for Seaborn, and then we run our same plotting function, it has automatically changed the style um, to look a little bit um, cleaner than what we saw before. Um, so this is default not solid. This is uh, default C4. Uh, same plot, different style. Uh, so additional things that we might want to do are, for example, to include error bars. Uh, so here, um, instead of doing all of the plotting by hand, like we're doing here with this ax.bar, um, what we're going to actually do is rely on a seaboard function called bar plot. Um, and seaboard, I highly recommend taking, taking a look at it in more detail, looking at the documentation, because it really create, uh, includes a lot of really helpful plotting functions um, that are really intuitive to use. So like bar plot says on the x-axis plot the robot, on the y-axis plot the number of tasks. Um, make the color be based on the inference method, and then um, make the, the order on the x-axis be fixed, reactive, and pre predictive, and the order of the colors be oracle and Bayesian. Um, and when we do that, we get a much nicer looking plot with the orders as we specified, and now um, Seaboard automatically computes 95% um, confidence intervals for us and, and displays them with the, the bars. Um, so that's much nicer already. Um, one other thing that we might want to do uh, to make this actually look nice for publication quality is rather than saying, like, have this um, legend up here with Oracle and Bayesian, it might be nice if we could say, like, uh, do Oracle, Bayesian, Oracle, Bayesian, Oracle, Bayesian, and then have larger labels for fixed, reactive, and predictive. Um, just might look a little bit nicer. So to do that, what we're going to do is um, another uh, use another method from Seaboard called facet grid. Um, we're getting a little bit more complicated now, but what this does is it basically says, create a set of subplots um, in, where each subplot will correspond to like this group of the data, and then you do you tell the facet grid to use this math method to actually create the plots on those subplots themselves. Um, and so what we're going to do is create three separate subplots where the x ticks are Oracle and Bayesian, and then the x label of each of the subplots is fixed, reactive, and predictive. That's how we're going to get these two different label sizes that we want. So if I run that, um, um, I, the x ticks aren't actually set yet, but we're now in a position where we can easily set them, where each subplot corresponds to one of the different robot personalities. Um, to set those labels, um, we're going to write another little function here. Um, a lot of this is very verbose, but it's kind of, it's, it's not doing anything particularly complicated. It's really just doing things like set the X labels to have these values and like set, um, you know, set the Y label to be uh, empty on some of these plots and, and have stuff on other plots. So uh, uh, that's, uh, that's what we get when we do this. So now we have our Oracle, Bayesian, Oracle, Bayesian, Oracle, Bayesian, and then the three different robot types. 
Um, so this is already looking much nicer than what we had before. Um, but it's still not great. This style is not nice in particular because the background kind of like um, makes the, the light colored bar almost disappear, especially on this projector. Um, and the, in general, the background I find is kind of confusing. My general strategy when creating plots is always just to have a, a solid white background for the plot. Um, so uh, Seaborn makes it really easy to ch make those changes too. So the default style that it uses is something called, I think, grid. Uh, but we can set uh, the style to be something called white, which will give us a white background, like that. Um, and it also, you can also set it to do things to like change the font um, family to like the Times New Roman style font um, or a serif font. Uh, and, um, and, and so here, this is already now looking almost like something that you might see in a publication. Um, the last few tweaks that we're going to make are kind of very simple tweaks. We're going to change the color style, and then we're going to change the size of the plot, too. So, um, in particular, when we were creating this plot, what we wanted to do was have the colors not just be like all the same for all the Oracle robots and all the same for all the Bayesian robots, but have like light color correspond to one type of robot, like Oracle, and then dark color correspond to Bayesian, and then have different shades or different hues rather for the, the three different subplots. Um, this is sort of a non-standard type of coloring to do with Matplotlib, and so it's a little bit trickier to actually get that to work. Um, but basically what we have to do is inspect the Matplotlib plot so that we get uh, an object or variable for each bar, and then we set the color of that bar after it's been plotted. Um, so the colors that we're going to use are these ones that I sort of just picked out by hand. Um, Seaborn gives us a nice method for actually viewing what those colors look like, called PAL plot. So here we're going to do um, black for fixed oracle, gray for Bayesian or uh, fixed Bayesian, um, gray for uh, reactive oracle, very for reactive Bayesian, um, gold for um, predictive oracle, and then light yellow for predictive. Um, and so here, the way that we do that is after the plot has been plotted, so we have this function here, which is going to take in our axes, um, iterate over each of the subplots. The bars are something called patches in that plotlib terminology. Um, it's, a, it's like a, a patch that's being plotted. Um, I'm not really sure where that term comes from, but that's kind of how I think about it. Um, so we, we pull out the patches for that subplot, which there's two patches per, per subplot because there's two bars per subplot. And so then we set the first patch to have a dark color and the second patch to have a light color. And then we also are setting um, some hatch marks on that so that the second bar has uh, hatch marks like that. Um, so now the color is the better. Um, and so the last thing that we want to do is just, this is too wide for a plot. In a, uh, for a figure in a paper, so we're going to make it much smaller. Long figures, I typically use the size of six by three inches, um, but you can kind of do whatever you think looks best for your particular paper. Um, so we just do fig that set size inches, six comma three, and now um, it is a much nicer uh, aspect ratio as well. So that was kind of a, a whirlwind of different things that you can do to, to change what your plot looks like. Um, but a lot of them are actually like the same types of operations that you do over and over. So it'll be a bit of like an annoying, it's a bit of a steep learning curve to, to remember what are all the functions that I need for setting the x-tick, setting the x-tick labels, setting the titles, the, the x and y labels, all of these different things. There's kind of a lot to keep track of there. But once you sort of internalize all of that, it's actually really easy to make these types of plots because it's kind of the same recipe components that you use over and over. And the only really non-standard thing I did in this plot was the coloring of the bars. Um, but again, this is actually some, a reason why I would encourage you to try to at least play around with creating your plots programmatically like this is because we actually use the same color scheme for three of the same or three different plots in the same paper. And so after I figured it out for the first plot, it was really easy to apply it to the other plots that I wanted to do too. Um, and you know, you might I, different people have different ways for creating their their own plots and doing the styling. The way that I used to do it before I started doing it this way was actually to um, create sort of a basic plot in that plot and then pull it into like Illustrator or Inkscape and then edit the SVG file. 
um, which works fine if it's like kind of a one-off plot and if you don't expect to have to make a lot of changes to it. But in practice, that almost never happens. Like, you know, you're, you're working with your collaborators on the paper and they're like, oh, you know what? Like, so the color, for example, was something that we went back and forth on a lot. And um, I had the colors one way first and then my collaborators were like, no, no, we need to do the colors a different way. And if I had done all of that in, um, uh, in Illustrator, then I would have had to uh, like do a lot of hand editing to, to get those changes made. But once I had figured out how to kind of do six different colors for the bars, it was really kind of changing like two lines of code whenever they wanted for me to try something out. Um, and so it, you know, there's sort of a higher startup cost, but then the payoff is really big later down the line in terms of time. So, um, so I, I recommend um, trying to get in the habit of doing that. Um, okay, so uh, let's now, are there any questions about this before we move on to the, the last notebook? Okay. Alright, exporting the notebook to other formats. So, uh, most of the time when you use the notebook, you're trying to use it in the notebook. There's a, like, a little bit of a confusing terminology because there's the notebook document and then there's the notebook browser view. So for the browser view, I'm going to re refer to that as the live notebook because it's the notebook you can actually execute and, and edit. Um, but you can view the notebook in many other ways, for example, as HTML or as Markdown or um, really whatever you want. Um, and so the way that we do that is by exporting the notebook file um, to these different formats and then viewing them uh, in different ways rather than the, the live notebook itself. And the core way that we do that is um, using this Jupyter MD convert command, which is also, you can also use it through the menu itself. So I can go file, download as, and then there's a bunch of different forms here that I can choose from. Um, so for example, HTML. Um, that will download it for me now, and I can open it, and I, that's, that's what the notebook will look like if I download it as HTML. It's static, so I can't edit these cells. It's just a, a static HTML view. But the more powerful way to do it is, rather than doing it through the menu bar, is to do it um, in convert itself. Um, and I'll show you why we might want to do that in a moment. It'll become clear by the time we get to the end of the notebook. But just to show you how to sort of reproduce the simple versions that you might do just using this file download as thing. Um, basically, the, um, so the, these are commands that you could run either on the command line, but you can also do them through the notebook itself. Um, I showed you before we did this like um, exclamation point cat for file name, if you remember that from the earlier notebooks. This is the bash magic, which is kind of like the R magic, and it's basically the same as this exclamation point. This just allows you to write multiple lines within the same cell, whereas this exclamation point only allows you to do one thing um, within the cell. Um, so we're not going to use the exclamation point, but we could do, we, these are basically equivalent. Um, just so try to um, avoid any confusion there. Um, but so basically what we do is we, we tell it, we use dash dash two, and then we tell it the format we want to export the notebook to, and then we give it the name of the notebook. So this is, we're going to export this reproducible class notebook that we just went through. We're going to um, export it to Python. So this might be useful, for example, if you're working in the notebook and now you have this really big notebook with a lot of code in it, and you decide, I, I want to actually turn this code into like a Python file um, so that I can import it and then use it in other notebooks, rather than, because you can't really import code from notebooks. Um, so you might want to convert it to Python and then have it be importable. Um, so we'll run this cell, it'll, it'll take a few seconds, um, and it'll give us an output, it says it's converting it to Python, then it, it's writing um, to one dash reproducible plotlib.py. Um, I have a link to that file here, so we can click on that link. Um, and here, now you can see this is a, it doesn't have a nice syntax highlight, but it is just a regular file. Um, and all of the markdown and stuff that we have written in the notebook previously is now in comments. Um, and the, the Python itself is, is, in, um, is not in comments. Um, you'll see that there are a few kind of like um, uh, notebook specific things that are uh, artifacts now in this uh, created Python file. So remember how we can use the last variable in the last, or use the variable in the last line of the cell to get it to display? That's what's going on here, but in a Python file, it's totally useless to have that. It's not going to do anything. So you probably would want to go through and then actually edit the Python file that's created doing this. 
to remove lines like this. Um, but otherwise, it, it should be something that you can then just execute um, and get the same behavior as you would get if you were doing it through the notebook itself. Um, another thing we might want to do, like I just showed you, would be to convert it to HTML. Um, and so again, that's uh, dash dash to HTML rather than dash dash to Python. And something else we can do is actually tell it to execute the notebook, the whole notebook, before converting it to HTML. The reason why we might want to do that is because um, we might want to ensure that like, the notebook has been rerun with um, you know, the, most, the latest version of whatever dependencies we're using. Or maybe you know, if I come to, uh, where, where do I have that notebook open? Um, you know, here I have, let's say, I uh, run a few more cells like this. And OK, so now like, these cells have actually been run like, at the last stuff of the so who knows, maybe like, whatever output we have here is actually inconsistent. So in the same way that we might want to restart the kernel and rerun the whole notebook from top to bottom, we can tell um, any convert to do that for us by passing this execute flag. Um, it'll take a little bit longer to run the whole thing because it's actually going through and executing all of the cells, but we wait for a few seconds. It's done. So it says again what it's doing, that it's executing the notebook and then writing it out to HTML. And so now if we open this HTML file up, we'll see, you can tell that it's now been rerun from scratch because notice how the um, these input numbers, which they change, you might have noticed this, they change every time you run a cell. Um, so here, um, so it's actually gone through and rerun the whole notebook and then executed all the outputs are there. Um, and it's a nice HTML file that we can use. Um, so that's really nice, especially like if you want to send the notebook around to other people who might not have it installed. You can export it to HTML and then just send it to them as an HTML file, and, and then they, they can just look at it you know, in their email or whatever. Um, another uh, thing that I like to do is actually to convert the notebooks to Markdown and then use them as a blog post. So a lot of blogging platforms use Markdown as the, the sort of language for writing your blog posts. Um, and this, this uh, reproducible plots um, post that we went through is actually, this is a blog post that I wrote. Um, and and this is, I used this uh, mbconvert conversion to convert it to the right format so that I could use it in my blog. Um, the blog that I use is called Juckle. Um, which I'm not going to go into the details of how Jekyll works exactly, except just to say that the format that it uses is Markdown. So we need to convert the blog post or convert the notebook to Markdown, um, and then do a few special things. The the Jekyll blog post have some special metadata at the top of them that says like what the title of the post is and what the publication date and stuff like that. And so um, this uh, special uh, syntax here is is some config options for MB convert uh, that is going to tell it to do all of those things. So we're going to tell it to export to Markdown. Um, we're going to tell it to execute the notebook. Um, you know, just kind of the same way of doing what we were doing before. And then we also have this special preprocessor that will format format things specially for Jekyll. Um, you can again look at the source of that here if you want. The um, and this MD convert utils file has the, the source of this Jekyll preprocessor. And so um, then, uh, so we'll create that config file, and then we tell it to use this config file that we just created, um, and then we, we give it the, um, the name of the file that we want to uh, convert, and again, it prints out a bunch of stuff, and now we have our markdown file, where here, this is the special Jekyll stuff that, that we created, um, and then the rest is uh, the same contents of the notebook, but uh, in, in special Jekyll format. So there's a few things to, that we did special to make this happen. One, one is this title that I mentioned. Um, another thing is, is actually highlighting the Python code so that it shows up as Python um, rather than just uh, like no syntax highlighting at all. And that those are both things that happen using this um, this Jekyll preprocessor and then a special um, template file that tells it how to, to do that highlighting. And that's a bit of a more like complicated um, like how that's actually working under the hood is a bit more complicated, but I'm happy to explain it in more detail if people are interested. Um, but the it, this is kind of 
I wanted to show you this just as kind of a proof of concept to show you if you use special templates and special preprocessors with ND convert, you can do a lot more with the notebook than you might be able to do by um, just converting it to sort of standalone HTML. Um, so there's really a lot of ways that you can use the notebook um, and different formats that you can convert to. Okay, so we have, I guess, five minutes now for questions or free working. I'm happy to do whatever, whatever would be most helpful for you in the remaining time that we have. Maybe no big group questions, so if you just want to work on stuff on your own, um, if you raise your hand, I'm happy to come around and like talk to you about stuff if you want to talk to me just while I want about anything. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, I, I oh, okay. need it to I think I could have done it. Uh, Thank <laughs> you. 